So today we're going to talk about chapter 13. When we get to lab, I'm going to go over a worksheet with you on chapter 12 uh, so that you can look to see what your knowledge is of just neural tissue in general. Chapter 13, though, is talking about the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Then when we come back, we'll be discussing chapter 14, which is the brain and cranial nerves, right? So today we're just looking at the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. And um, so we will, we're going over a lot of anatomy on the spinal cord. Uh, we'll talk about sensory receptors in chapter 15, okay? And uh, the sensory receptors stimulate action potentials in nerves that get sent to the spinal cord in what we call spinal nerves. And then the spinal cord, uh, sometimes responses are mediated right at the spinal cord, and sometimes that information has to travel up to the brain so the brain can decide what the response is going to be. But if the spinal cord is going to mediate that response, we call that a reflex. So we're going to talk about reflexes too. And then the command is sent out over motor neurons out to skeletal muscles. Right? So with all spinal nerves, all spinal nerves are involved in the somatic nervous system because the effectors are always going to be skeletal muscles. Okay. Let's just take a look at this picture first and then we'll go to some of the drawings. So this is showing the, the spinal cord. Uh, the spinal cord goes all the way down that vertebral foramen in your spine, in the bones of the spine. It starts up at your brain stem at the area that's called the medulla oblongata and then it will extend all the way down to L2, so the second lumbar vertebrae. It'll extend all the way down there. So that's the spinal cord. And then you can see all of these nerves coming off of the spinal cord. All of these nerves coming off of there are called spinal nerves, right? So we're gonna look at what forms spinal nerves. We can see in the neck area, in the cervical area, well, first let me tell you that the, the areas of the spinal cord can be divided up into the cervical region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, and the sacral region. So there's four different regions, and they don't quite correspond to the vertebrae. So the spinal cord is actually shorter than the spine. So if you remember, the spine had, you know, seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and then you had the sacrum. But the spinal cord doesn't extend that long because the spinal cord stopped growing when um, you were about five years old, and the spine and the body kept growing. So the spinal cord was the length it was going to be at five, and then the rest of you kept growing. And that's why the spine uh, is longer than the spinal cord itself. Okay. All right, so on the spinal cord, we see that there's these areas. Um, this area here is called the cervical enlargement. So we'll see that there's just a bulge in that spinal cord right there. And a little bit lower down, uh, it says lumbar enlargement, although we're going to see this more in the um, thoracic area. You'll see like a lumbar enlargement, we call it. And then at the very tip of the spinal cord, it starts to taper down like a cone, and we call that the conus medullaris. Conus medullaris, that's where it's really tapering down um, to a point. And at the very tip then, we call that very tip the inferior tip of the spinal cord. From the interior tip of the spinal cord, there is this ligament. And this ligament hangs on to the very tip of that spinal cord and extends all the way down into the coccyx. And it attaches to the coccyx. So that whole 
thing there, there's just like a ligament that attaches down into the coccyx area. Okay. And so what that does, what that, that ligament type thing does, uh, we call that the phylum terminal, and it terminates in the coccyx or in a ligament that's in the coccyx. That just keeps the spinal cord from flopping around in there. So when you stand on your head, it's still pulled pretty taut so that it's not just bunching up by your head. It keeps it in place. So when you're moving around, it's not whacking on the side of the bones. It's staying pretty firmly in place. So that is the phylum terminal. All right, now when we look at all of these spinal nerves, and we'll go back to the cervical area, we can see that we number these spinal nerves C1, so there's C1 on the right and C1 on the left, then C2, then C3, then C4, C5, C6, C7, and C8. C8. How many bones did we say were in the cervical vertebrae? Seven. There's only seven, but there's eight cervical nerves. That's because the very first um, cervical spinal nerve exits above C1, and the second one exits below C1. Okay, so here's our spine. This will help to make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to draw the spinal nerves in. Um, C1 exits above C1, C2, above C2, C3, above C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and then C8. So you can see that um, C8 exits below the seventh vertebrae, right? That's what gives you eight cervical vertebrae. Now when we start talking about the thoracic vertebrae, we start looking at T1 through T12 spinal nerves. So T1 exits below the first thoracic vertebrae, T2 below the second, T3 below the third, T4 below the fourth, and we just keep moving down T5, T6, T7, T8, T9, T10, T11, and T12. They all exit below their vertebrae at that point. Then we go into the lumbar vertebrae. In the lumbar vertebrae, we have the L spinal nerves. So L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. So L5 exits below the L5 vertebrae, right? And then we have the sacrum. And in the sacrum, we have S, uh, the sacral bone is one solid bone, but there's holes in there. There's foramen in there uh, where there would typically be the intervertebral foramen. So we have uh, the first segment, the second segment, third, fourth, and fifth segment of the sacrum. So after, um, in, the, in the opening, the foramen below the first segment, we have S1. Below the second segment, we have S2. Below the third, we have S3. Below the fourth, we have S4. And below the fifth, we have S5, okay? So with, when we're talking about spinal nerves coming off of the, off of the spinal cord, this is how we end up with eight cervical vertebrae, or eight cervical spinal nerves, but 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral, right? So eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral spinal nerves. Okay? Now, I also put a picture in there on the side here, which is showing the actual um, length of the spinal cord. And so we're showing, this is the cervical spinal cord, the cervical segment. This is the thoracic segment. This is the lumbar segment. And this is the sacral segment. Okay. 
So that's how long the spinal cord is. And look at it ends right at L2. So that's, that's how long that is. Now, um, the spinal nerves that are coming off of these, these segments of the spinal cord, they have to exit through the intervertebral foramen in the spine. So we can see when we're looking at uh, the cervicals, here's the cervical segment, there's C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8. They don't have to go very far to exit the spine. It's a pretty short distance between the spinal cord and the opening in the spine, right? When we get to the thoracic level, we can see that the thoracics are going to leave and go a pretty short distance to exit the spine, to leave through, to leave through that intervertebral foramen. But look at, as we go further down, our thoracic segment is ending pretty soon and all of these spinal nerves have to exit through their respective areas in the spine. So look what's happening to their spinal nerves. Look what's happening as we get a little bit lower, right? We get a little bit, li bit lower and we start to see that these spinal nerves, now we're in the lumbar segment, they're starting to elongate in order to exit out of the spine where they're supposed to exit. They're elongating, getting longer, right? Finally, we get to the sacral level, and the sacral level, those nerves are getting really long to exit where they're supposed to exit. So in the end, when we have all of these long spinal nerves, they start to look like a horse's tail. So we call this big group of horse's tail the cauda equina. Cauda means tail, equina means horse, horse's tail, because they're getting longer and they start to look like a horse's tail. Okay. Here's a better picture of the cauda equina. So here's the tip of the spinal cord right here. And all of these spinal nerves are getting progressively longer, coming off of the spinal cord, and they're longer, and they, this whole area then is called the cauda equina, where all of those spinal nerves kind of form this horse's tail. Now I want to show you a cross section of the spinal cord. This is what the cross section looks like. So cross section means we've just cut it in half and we're looking inside it to see what exactly is going on in the spinal cord. And all levels of the spinal cord are going to look very similar to this. This is like a typical uh, section of the spinal cord. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. They all look pretty much similar. It's just that uh, the gray matter and the white matter might be bigger or smaller depending on the area. So when we're looking at this, um, this section here, first of all, we look at the spinal cord in here and we see that this area in here is all gray. And so we call that the gray matter, the inside. It looks kind of like a butterfly and we call that the gray matter. So gray matter is going to be composed of neural tissue that's not myelinated. And what did we say in our neurons is the area that has nissle bodies that is not myelinated? The axon, so these are, not the axon, but the cell bodies. So in the gray matter, it's gray because of all the cell bodies that are in there. They're clusters of cell bodies. Okay, they're in areas um, that we're gonna look at more closely when we get to advanced. And then we see this other area here. So that's the cell bodies are in the gray matter. 
And then we see this other area around it that's called the white matter. And white matter, we said that neural tissue looks white because of, because of myelin. So the white matter is made of myelinated axons. It's, hard, it's largely composed of myelinated axons. Okay. Now the, um, the spinal cord looks like it's kind of separated almost in half. We see a line here, and then we see a gap right here. So the gap is on the anterior side of the spinal cord, and we call that the anterior median fissure. You can remember that it's anterior because ants can crawl into that space. So it's the anterior median fissure. Okay. This little slit on the backside that's not wide at all, that is called the posterior median sulcus. The posterior median sulcus. Okay. All right, and then we have these extensions coming off of the neuron, or uh, off of the spinal cord. And this one over here, that one is called the, it's on the posterior side, so we'll call it the posterior root. Another acceptable name for that would be the dorsal root. And you might hear me slip up and say dorsal root because that's what we've always called it. The newer edition of the book is now calling it the posterior root. Okay. And on the other side, where we have the anterior median fissure, this is called the anterior root. And where the two of them merge together, we call that the spinal nerve. Now those are, that's the anatomical names for those, but functionally the anterior root and the posterior root carry very different neurons. The posterior root carries sensory neurons only. And the anterior root carries motor neurons only. By the time we get to the spinal nerve, it carries both. So we'll say that the spinal nerve is mixed because it carries both sensory and motor neurons. It carries both. Now, I want you to look at the posterior root, and you can see that there's this bulge here in the posterior root, and that bulge is called a ganglion or spinal ganglion. Ganglion are clusters of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So this is the peripheral nervous system right here. As soon as we leave the spinal cord, we're into the peripheral nervous system. So we have this um, spinal ganglion where those neurons are. So anatomically, if we wanted to look at that, if you remember what a sensory neuron looks like, the sensory neuron had dendrites and then an axon, and then it had a cell body hanging off of it, and then the axon continued, and then it went into the spinal cord to the synaptic terminal. Right? So that's, um, that's just the structure. So all of these cell bodies here, because in that, that um, posterior root, there's going to be a lot of those neurons, not just one. You're going to get a cluster of those cell bodies. And that's why we have that little bulge there, because that's where those cell bodies are clustering. Okay, and then inside the spinal cord, 
that's where our motor neuron is going to begin. And if you remember what the structure of a motor neuron is, it's more of a multipolar neuron. The sensory neuron was unipolar. The multipolar neuron starts with the cell body and the dendrites. It has a long axon coming off of it. And then it ends at a synaptic terminal. So there's the cell body that's creating that gray look, right? And when we get out to the spinal nerves then, we have both the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. They're mixed together. Now those neurons, the spinal nerve is very, very short. So if you remember in the spine, in between each vertebrae, you have that opening that's called the intervertebral foramen. It's made up from, um, as you're looking at the pedicles, the top of the pedicle is, is um, that's where the intervertebral foramen is, and that's where the spinal nerve is coming out. And it stops right there. It's super short. And as soon as it exits through that intervertebral foramen, it starts to divide. All those neurons, those sensory and motor neurons, they start to divide up. And they're going to join with the sensory neurons and the motor neurons of other spinal nerves. Okay. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit about how they uh, are able to do that. Okay. All right, before uh, we go further and look at that spinal nerve and see what it, how it creates the nerves that go into your arms and legs, I want to take a look at the protective covering over the top of the uh, spinal cord. So we have these meninges that cover the spinal cord. They're protective layers, and there's three different layers to them, and there's spaces in between those layers. So this is a diagram that could be on your lab exam. It's showing the pia mater, which is the innermost layer. And it's actually very tightly adhered to the spinal cord. So it's right here. If you tried to dissect it, you would be peeling it off of the spinal cord and some of the spinal cord neural tissue would come with it. Then there's going to be a little space, and then we have the second layer right here, and that's called the arachnoid mater. Uh, and then there's a little space, and then we have the outermost layer right here, and that's called the dura mater. So the dura mater is the outermost covering, and it's the most durable. So there it's the dura mater. So it's the toughest. It's the most durable. You can see that some of these meninges covers some of the spinal nerves too. But it's gonna end as soon as that spinal nerve exits out of the spinal cord. Right? So it helps to protect the spinal nerve. Now if we look at this view, or it helps to protect the spinal cord. If we look at this view right here, we have a model that's very similar to this. It's called the cervical vertebrae. So this down here is the spinous process. Uh, this on the front, this is the vertebral body right here. And so we're looking inside the vertebral foramen and we can see our spinal cord. Here's our anterior median fissure. Here's our posterior median sulcus. So we're flipped around a little bit. So since this is the anterior side, this is the ventral root. This is the posterior side. So there's the posterior root. So we've got the anterior root and the posterior root just to get your bearings. I'm gonna flip her around. Because this is how we were looking at it on the drawing. This is the posterior root, this is the anterior root, okay? Now let's look at the meninges because that's what we're talking about. So this outermost layer right here that's called the dura mater. Now on your model, you are going to see 
a layer. It looks like it's out here, but that's not, that is not um, part of the meninges at all. That out here, that's just a ligament, so ignore that. We don't have to know that. So the dura mater is there, and then there's a little space, and then we have the arachnoid mater. There's the arachnoid mater right there, that inner space right there, or not that inner, inner covering right there, okay, the middle covering. That's the arachnoid mater, okay. And then we have the pia mater, and the pia mater is adhered very closely to the spinal cord itself. It goes in through that median fissure, all the way around. Okay, so it covers the whole spinal cord very tightly. Now we have some spaces in between these layers that we have to know. So we're going to start, we're going to look at the outermost layer where we, um, we're going to look at the dura mater, and we look on the outside of the dura mater and we see this fat out there. So that space between the dura mater and the vertebra, the ver vertebrae, that is called the epidural space epidural, epidural space. So guess what type of injections go there? Epidural. There you go, right? So that's where epidural injections are going to go. The needle will go in between the vertebrae and will go right into that space, and that's where, that's that's where it, that goes, right? If they go a little too far and they hit the dura mater, ey, now they're going to have headaches, severe headaches if they nick that dura mater. It's gonna take a while for that to heal, okay? Then we look and we see between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, there's another space in there. And that space is called the subdural space, subdural. It's the space between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. So that space is normally not there. We're showing it here so you know where it's at, but normally that space, those two layers would be pretty close together. They're not adhered to each other, and a space can be created, but it's not going to be created unless maybe there's some bleeding in there. And if we get bleeding in there in between those two layers, then it will cause that space to appear, and then we would call that a subdural hematoma. Okay? because there's blood in between those spaces. Then we look uh, between the arachnoid mater, and which is uh, right here again. So this is the arachnoid mater right there. And then here's the pia mater right here. And if we look between those two layers, there's another space, and that space is called the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid. So sub always means underneath. So it's underneath. It's one layer deeper. It's, it's the space deep to the arachnoid mater. So what is in the subarachnoid space is a fluid that we call cerebral spinal fluid. CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid should be sterile. It shouldn't have any bacteria in it. Um, it's, it has a different composition than the interstitial fluid, but otherwise it's very similar to that. But if uh, a person is suspected of having like meningitis or some type of infection, that is where the needle goes to draw out that fluid so that they can look to see is it clear or is it milky colored, like does it have bacteria in it? So they draw out the cerebral spinal fluid in that space. Okay. So let's look at um, the distribution of spinal I have a drawing of this picture for you, but I'm going to show it on here. 
each of the spinal nerves that comes out of the spinal cord, they are going to monitor a specific area of skin. And so this is a mapping uh, of dermatomes. So the dermatomes are showing the regions of skin that are monitored by specific spinal nerves, right? So for instance, we see right here, look at C5. And that area of skin right there, that, that orangey area of skin right there, that's monitored by the C5 spinal nerve. That means that any sensation that happens on that area right there, if you poked that area with a pin, that information would have to go into the spinal cord through the C5 spinal nerve. And down here on these last three fingers, that's C8. So if you were to poke those fingers right there, that information would have to go into the spinal cord through the C8 spinal nerve. So the spinal nerves are able to um, monitor different patches of skin. Each spinal nerve has its own area of skin that it's monitoring. Now, occasionally, these spinal nerves can be infected by a varicella virus. And then a person can get uh, a rash along the dermatome. And we call that, do you know? Shingles. So shingles is a, a, it's an infection, a varicella, like the chicken pox um, virus. It's an infection that occurs in people that are uh, older. Um, it doesn't happen in children, uh, but a child, you would have to have had the chicken pox virus in order to get shingles later on in life. Okay, so you first have this chicken pox virus and it stays latent in your body. And then later on in life, it can come out and it can cause a uh, rash along one of these dermatomes. So it could cause a rash around T8 and you'd see a rash, it would come out as a rash, it's very painful, and then it blisters, and then it just um, kind of bursts open and scabs over. So it's, it's very painful. So here, uh, nope, we used to have a picture, we don't anymore. But it, it's just uh, little blisters along the dermatome. So they can happen anywhere. Uh, we can see that even some of these uh, spinal, uh, the cranial nerves also have their own dermatomes to them where they're monitoring certain areas of skin. But for our purposes, we're talking about dermatomes of the spinal nerves, and we, we just need to know that they're a mapping uh, area of those spinal nerves, of what the spinal nerves monitor. Right, now we're gonna look at peripheral nerves. And what I told you before was that these uh, spinal nerves are very short and then suddenly they branch off. And as they branch, their sensory and motor neurons are going to merge with the sensory and motor neurons of other spinal nerves. So here we can see, uh, and they form what we call a plexus, a plexus. So here's the cervical plexus. And we can see the C1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and uh, even five cervical spinal nerves, and the neurons start to branch off, and they join with the branches of the other spinal nerves, and at the very end, they end up all merging back together, and they form peripheral nerves. So peripheral nerves come from the mixing and matching of spinal nerves, right? They're from the mixing and matching of spinal nerves. And so then we, num we name these peripheral nerves. The mixing and matching of the spinal nerves in the cervical region from C1 to C5 is called the cervical plexus. And the nerve that comes out of there, the peripheral nerve that comes out of there that I want you to know about is called the phrenic nerve the phrenic nerve. So the phrenic nerve is actually a mixing of C3, 
4 and 5. The spinal nerves, neurons from C3, 4, and 5 join together to form this phrenic nerve. Now the phrenic nerve then goes to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the muscle under your lungs that makes you breathe. It, it, it causes you to breathe. So you have to have this phrenic nerve functioning in order to breathe, right? So the information, if, if you were to have um, a lesion, like a spinal cord injury, above C, C3, you wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to breathe. If you had a lesion below C5, you still have the phrenic nerve coming out of the spinal cord and you would be able to still breathe on your own. Right? But any damage to that level C3, 4, or 5, um, any damage there, you would not be able to breathe on your own because that's the phrenic nerve that's helping you to breathe. So I need you to know that the phrenic nerve comes from the cervical plexus, that the cervical plexus is made up of spinal nerves, um, neurons from spinal nerves C1 to C5. The next plexus that I want you to know is called the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is more, it's going to innervate the, um, it's going to send, it's going to branch off into nerves in the arm. The brachial plexus is from C5 to T1. C5 to T1. So as the spinal nerves from C5 to T1 are all mixing and matching, they're going to fall, they're going to create these peripheral nerves that you need to know. The axillary nerve, the radial nerve, and the ulnar nerve. Right? They all come from the brachial plexus. Those are nerves that you have to know on your lab list. So you need to know which nerves come from which plexuses, and you need to know um, where the plexuses are. You'd have to identify them uh, as well. Where are they? So the brachial plexus is innervating. It's, it's, um, all of the nerves are going into the shoulder and the arm. The cervical plexus is um, the main one that you need to know is the phrenic nerve. If we go lower down, we see that there is a lumbar plexus. The lumbar plexus... Uh, consists of spinal nerves from the T12 spinal nerve all the way to the L4 spinal nerve. So those spinal nerves, the neurons from those spinal nerves are mixing and matching, and there's going to be one nerve that comes out of there that I need you to know. That's called the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve comes from the lumbar plexus. So here you can see the femoral nerve right here. Okay. There is, now these nerves are going to branch. All of the nerves branch. So the femoral nerve is going to branch, and as it branches, one of the branches I want you to know is called the saphenous nerve. So the saphenous nerve is a branch of the femoral nerve. And that goes down the inner thigh, all the way down, the inner thigh, all the way down to your ankle. So that's the saphenous nerve. Then finally, we have the last plexus, which is called the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus is a mixture of neurons from L4 to S4. So there's mixing and matching of those neurons, and the nerve that I want you to know coming from the sacral plexus is the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is a big nerve on the back of the thigh. So that's on the posterior thigh. And that's the sciatic nerve. 
All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about are reflexes. And reflexes are automatic responses of the body that are um, coordinated in the spinal cord. So these are most of the time when you have sensory information come into your body, it has to go up to the brain, and then the brain has to tell you what to do with it. And it'll send out a command telling your skeletal muscles to do something, right? But with a reflex, uh, with a spinal reflex, a stimulus will um, stimulate a sensory neuron. The sensory neuron will enter into the spinal cord. That'll synapse with a motor neuron, which will send a command out to your skeletal muscles, right? So it's, we say that it's a, it's a response that's mediated at the spinal cord, that it doesn't have to go up to your brain in order for a response to occur. All right, so that's the short story. Let's, let's, let me show you what that means. This is an example here. I'm gonna use this example and tell you what all the steps of a reflex are. It's a simple reflex. A simple reflex means that in the spinal cord, there is only one synapse. So you have one synapse between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron, okay? There's one synapse, so we call it a simple or a monosynaptic reflex. Monosynaptic. Mono means one, synaptic means synapse. So we have the sensory neuron, the motor neuron, one synapse between the two. One synapse where acetylcholine is released, binds to the, end, binds to the, um, the motor neuron receptor, okay? So let's, let's start at the beginning and see what happens. So first of all, we're gonna start way back by the receptor. So the first step in a reflex is that a receptor has to be activated. So step number one, receptor is activated. Now in this case, the receptor is found in the quadricep muscle, right? That's where that receptor is. And the receptor's name is a muscle spindle. That's the name of the receptor. So that those cells, they're specialized cells, that's what receptors are. And those specialized cells are detecting a stretch of the, of the muscle spindle. Those cells are stretching and they become activated. So in this case, how are we stretching that? Well, this is a hammer that your doctor will use, a reflex hammer, and he's hitting that patellar ligament, and that's stretching the patella, which stretches the quadricep muscle, or quadriceps tendon, which stretches the quadriceps muscle. So these structures are being stretched just by this reflex hammer right here. Well, that's going to stretch that receptor. That stretches the muscle spindle, and the muscle spindle becomes activated. Okay. So right here in this picture, right there, you're seeing the muscle spindle becomes activated. So step one, the receptor becomes activated or stimulated, however you want to say it, okay? That will then stimulate the sensory neuron. So step two, the sensory neuron is stimulated. Step two. So here's the sensory neuron right there. That red line, that's the sensory neuron. That starts to generate action potentials. And exactly how we've been talking about, ACH binds to the receptor, causes sodium to come into the cell, the cell depolarizes, we get an action potential. And those action potentials travel all the way down that sensory neuron, and they enter into the spinal cord. And it ends at the synaptic terminals. Now we get a synapse right there. Acetylcholine's released, it binds to the... Uh, receptors on the motor neuron, we get action potential started in the motor neuron, right? So step three then will be the synapse. Step three is the synapse. 
between the sensory and the motor neuron. Step four then will be the motor neuron is stimulated. What does that mean? That means that action potentials will start on the motor neuron. So now we have action potentials moving down the axon of the motor neuron. And they're going to end on muscle tissue that we call the effector. And in this case, the muscle tissue is very close to where the receptors are. The muscle tissue is the quadricep muscle. quadricep muscle, right? So you have um, the stimulus, you have the receptor activated, you have the sensory neuron bringing information into the spinal cord that synapses onto the motor neuron, which brings those action potentials out to the, the um, quadricep muscle, and then the quadricep muscle contracts. And it's very fast, like that. If you had to talk about everything that had to happen at each little place, it would be, um, it, it would take you a lot longer than what it actually takes for that to happen. You'd have to talk about the generation of an action potential on the sensory neuron. Then you'd have to talk about the synapse and the generation of an action potential on the motor neuron. Then you would have to ta talk about what happens at the neuromuscular junction. And think about all those things we learned. Acetylcholine being released, binding to the receptor, the gates opening up, sodium coming in, potassium moving out, action potential. Then it has to go to the next segment of the axon, then the next segment of the axon, then the next segment of the axon. So that would, that would take a long time to explain all of that, and it happens like that. So in one of our labs, we're going to use a reflex hammer on each other and then we're going to draw this out, and you're going to explain how we get to this, um, how, how this happens, and how fast this happens, why, you know, what is happening, okay? You're going to spell it out. This is called a, this is a monosynaptic reflex. Your brain never has to know about this because no pain is involved. There's no pain. So your brain doesn't ever know about it. You can be watching it, and then your brain knows, okay? But otherwise, it happens so fast, your brain doesn't have to know about it at all. Now, there are some other types of reflexes that are called polysynaptic reflexes. Polysynaptic reflexes, um, are they have the same reflex arc. So this is the same. This is what we called the reflex arc. All of those steps that I talked about, it, they are part of the reflex arc. But a polysynaptic reflex means that in the spinal cord, there's more than one synapse. So here we see the sensory neuron is synapsing onto this white neuron, which is called a, an interneuron. And then the interneuron is synapsing onto the motor neuron. So we have one, two synapses there. So it's polysynaptic, more than one synapse. The reason that we have polysynaptic reflexes um, are they'll be involved in any type of reflex where pain is involved. Because you have this reflex where you're going to move your arm away from the pain or move your leg away from the pain, but the interneuron is also going to send information up to your brain so that you know about the pain, and there might be damage. So let's look at this. Here we have the arrival of the stimulus. This person puts their hand on a tack, and that hurts because it's stimulating a receptor. And the receptors are the nerve endings of this neuron. So sometimes receptors are specialized spe cells, like the muscle spindle. Sometimes they're just these specialized nerve endings, specialized dendrites. So the dendrite is, um, the dendrites are picking up that stimulus and becoming activated. We get action potentials that move down that sensory neuron 
the sensory neuron moves into the spinal cord and it synapses onto that interneuron. The interneuron then generates action potentials and those action potentials, some of them will go to the motor neuron and synapse on the motor neuron and generate action potentials that exit the spinal cord through the motor neuron out to the effector. So that's going to happen the fastest. And in this case, the receptor would be, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the effector, the effector would be the biceps muscle. Because your bicep muscle will contract and you'll pull your hand away from that tack. Right? So you put your hand down on the tack, the message goes in through the sensory neuron, synapses onto an interneuron, which synapses onto the motor neuron, the motor neuron goes back out to your, break, to your biceps brachii, and you contract and pull your hand away. So that's going to happen super fast, right? Because you have to get your hand away from the pain so that you're not causing more damage. But that interneuron then is also going to, um, it's going to diverge, it'll divide, and it'll start to send uh, action potentials up to your brain through one of its collateral axons. So now it goes up to your brain and your brain can say, ouch, yeah, that hurt, that was stupid, don't do that again. I better look and see, is the tack still in my hand? I better pull that out. Is it bleeding? I better put pressure on it to stop it. Is it still bleeding? I better call the doctor. Maybe I should put some antibiotic lotion on it. Maybe I should wash it underwater. So your brain has to, it has to be involved in this because pain and damage were involved. So we see polysynaptic reflexes whenever we have pain or damage. There's one last reflex I want to talk about, and that's the Babinski reflex. And the Babinski reflex is where try my drawings here. Oh, that's really bad. Oh yeah, that's really bad. Here's the foot. Okay. So with the Babinski reflex, you take the end, the other end of the um, the reflex hammer, so there's the reflex hammer, you take the other end of it and you scrape it along the bottom of the foot. Okay, You scrape it along the bottom of the foot. Now, um, normally what's going to happen is that whenever you have a painful stimulus like that, the normal reaction of the body is to curl up and you would see all of the toes curl up because they would not like that. That's a painful stimulus and everything wants to go into flexion mode, right? Get down in that fetal position, curl your toes, curl your fingers whenever there's pain. So those toes want to curl in, right? Um, <clears throat> and when they curl in like that, we say that it the Babinski reflex is negative. It's negative if the toes curl in like that. But if the toes don't curl in like that and you get extension of the toes instead and they extend outward, then we would say that that is the Babinski reflex is positive. And what that tells us is that somewhere in the spinal cord, that reflex is being inhibited, and you're not doing what you should normally do. Normally, you should be curling the toes and not extending the toes. So in that case, when we look at the Babinski reflex and we see that it's positive, we say there must be damage to the spinal cord. If the Babinski reflex is negative, <coughs> negative is normal. <coughs>
as with the majority of findings in the health field. Negative is normal. Now, this is true uh, for everyone over the age of two. But before two, if the toes curl, so under the age of two, uh, the Babinski reflex is normal. The extension of the toes is normal. So if you're testing a small infant, you would expect their toes to flare out. They haven't developed yet um, the ability to inhibit, uh, you haven't, they haven't developed the ability to curl those toes in yet, um, the reflex. They, haven't, they can curl their toes in, they haven't developed the reflex yet. Are there any questions? Then? All right.